I was born on 22nd March, 1881 in Bavaria, Germany. The second son to my parents, Anna and Johann Daniel Ferdinand Wilsdorf. I had an elder brother named Karl, and just a year after I was born, my mother gave birth to my younger sister, Anna. I wouldn't say I was born into a lap of luxury, but we were quite well off thanks to our family business selling iron goods. Welcome to Business Breakdowns, the channel where we break down the stories of the most successful companies in the world. If you enjoy this video, please hit the like and subscribe button so more people can hear stories like these. Unfortunately, my mother soon started to get quite ill over the next few years, ultimately leading to her death in 1892. And what was even more devastating was that just a year later, we lost our father as well, leaving us under the custody of our uncle. In order to take care of our expenses, our uncle sold our family business and put all three of us in a prestigious boarding school when I was just 12. Perhaps it was because I was too young and couldn't understand what exactly was good for me and my siblings that I absolutely hated this decision. I still remember how upset I was when I heard the news. Our uncle was not indifferent to our fate. Nevertheless, the way in which he made me become self-reliant very early in life made me acquire the habit of looking after my possessions and, looking back, I believe that it is to this that much of my success is due. As a student, mathematics and language classes always fascinated me. I wanted to learn different languages so I could roam the world. While at boarding school, I also became good friends with a Swiss boy who used to tell me stories of his birthplace, Le Chaux de Fonds, and also introduced me to the world of watches. As soon as I completed my education, I landed my first job of being an apprentice to a highly influential international pearl exporting company where I picked up on a lot of business tactics for making a profitable company. By the year 1900, I decided to follow my dreams and start traveling. And yes, you probably guessed right, I moved to Le Chaux de Fonds. When I got there, I was completely bowled over by the beauty of the city and by its rich culture of watchmaking. I was fortunate enough to get a new job there as an English correspondent and clerk with a very well-known watch firm, Kuno Corten, a company that exported around 1 million francs worth of pocket watches on an annual basis, who also produced some of their own watches from the ground up. I got to spend a lot of time around different kinds of watches during my time here and was also given the high responsibility to wind pocket watches, making sure that each and every watch told the accurate time. It was here that I truly started developing my passion for watchmaking. Soon, it was time to leave again. I took all my knowledge and experience with me and moved to London in 1903. It was here that I met a beautiful young English woman named Florence Francais Maycrotty, and we decided to marry not long after. To keep the income flowing, I had taken up a job in yet another influential watchmaking company in London. By 1905, I had saved up enough money to start something of my own. So along with my friend Alfred Davis, we opened up Wilsdorf and Davis, where we sold high-quality timepieces at affordable prices. Throughout the years in this business, I have come to realize two things. One, men would only carry pocket watches. And two, wristlets or wristwatches were looked down on as they were considered to be women's jewelry and therefore unmanly. You see, most people at the time had built a misconception that wristwatches had smaller movements, which meant a lesser accurate reading. But I was convinced that the future of watches lay in wristwatches, and I was willing to risk my career on it. So I partnered up with the Swiss watch movement company Aigler & Davis. With this new direction, I needed to rename the company. It needed to be something easy to pronounce, memorable, and be small enough to fit on the face of the wristwatch. I tried combining letters of the alphabet in every possible way. This gave me about a hundred names, but none of them felt quite right. 
It was on one morning when I was sitting on the upper level of a double-decker, powered at the time by horses, driving along Cheapside in London, that a good genie whispered in my ear, Rolex. A few days after this fruitful journey, the Rolex brand was filed in 1908 and then officially registered in Switzerland by Wilsdorf and Davis. In 1914, I obtained the world's first wristwatch chronometer rating from Switzerland and a Class A certificate of precision from London's Q Observatory. In spite of this, I remember we came into the limelight only during the First World War, which broke out later that year. My personal opinion was that pocket watches would almost completely disappear and that wristwatches would replace them definitively. And I was not mistaken in this opinion. During the war, soldiers realized that it was easier for them to wear a wristwatch rather than have their hands occupied in carrying a pocket watch just to check the time. A wristwatch also allowed them to have both hands free for combat, making it easier for them to synchronize their assaults. And so, the wristwatch finally started developing its due recognition. The war brought other changes too, like a 33% customs duty. This made it extremely hard and expensive for me to import my watch movements from Switzerland. I had to move again. And I decided that after the war in 1919, we could switch our base to Geneva once and for all. After settling in over the next couple of years, I started becoming bored of the same day on repeat. It was time for something new. I had to innovate further and so I introduced the world's first waterproof watch in 1927, the Rolex Oyster. To make sure people knew it was worth its salt, I handed it over to a female swimmer named Mercedes Blades, who wore it around her neck while swimming the English Channel. The watch turned out to be working perfectly even after a 15-hour swim in freezing cold water. In a way, my idea turned out to be a great marketing tactic for us. I posted an ad on the front page of the Daily Mail making the watch a global phenomenon. This brought in more attention from all around the world than I had ever expected. I couldn't just stop at that, and I wouldn't. I kept innovating trying to find the next first thing while trying to up our advertisement game, especially by associating ourselves with other sports personalities and adventurers. We focused on making the wristwatch much more resilient to extreme conditions, which led to the launch of the Rolex Perpetual a few years later, another revolutionary introduction in its field. Slowly, my brand Rolex was working its way up as one of the leading wristwatch making brands in the world. People started to prefer our watches over any other brand. During the Second World War, Air Force pilots wore Rolex over their general government issued watches. Unfortunately, when they were taken as prisoners of war, our watches were confiscated by the enemy. And of course, this was the least of their problems, obviously. When I found out about this, I was determined to reunite the officers with their Rolexes. They were still allowed to receive mail through the Red Cross, so I used it to mail new watches to them, making sure they knew not to worry about the payment until the end of the war. Here's another fascinating story that I heard from a client of mine, Corporal Clive James Nutting, who purchased our Rolex Oyster chronograph, which was quite impressive considering it was one of our more expensive pieces. Little did I know, the only reason he shelled out that amount of money was because of its chronograph stopwatch feature. And when Clive was taken as a prisoner of war, he used the watch to time the frequency of German patrols to help plan the escape of several officers. After the war, I continued to innovate and came up with multiple iconic watches like the Datejust, Submariner, Daydate, and Milgauss, each of them introducing a new set of features to the watch world. In 1994, my wife passed away, and I needed to take a little step back. We did not have children of our own, so I set up my own foundation. We called it the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation, 
and in 1960, I handed all of my ownership in Rolex to this foundation. To this day, the foundation owns Rolex and uses some of its income to support charity and social causes. Rolex has reached heights I could never have imagined, and today it's worth over $8 million. My name is Hans Wilsdorf, and this is the story of Rolex. If you guys liked that video, please hit the like button. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Just the research and the editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. Um, we produce over like 12 videos per month, so that's literally 8 cents per video. Thanks so much guys. Peace out.